fans and welcome back to the Demon Land podcast. My name is Andy and the D stayed true to their 2021 form, adding a draw to the two losses and one win against bottom four teams in the league. Tonight, I'm hoping my co-host will be able to explain to me why we have no problem defeating top eight teams but cannot seem to perform against the rest. And will this form follow us into the run home and the finals? Joining me tonight, long-time Demon Lander George. Good evening, George. Good evening, Andy. Good evening, Bin Man. Good evening, everyone else. As you can see, we're here on a Monday night this week. This is to ensure the maximum recovery time until the next game because our MFCSS has certainly flared up badly this week. Well, in uh, in COVID times as well, you never know when you could be playing. So, uh, yeah, we've got to get these podcasts. Uh, we've got to bank them, bank them early. Uh, like we've banked wins early and uh, hope for the best. Um, also joining us uh, tonight, uh, we have uh, Demon Land's resident experts on game plans and all that jazz, Bin Man. Good evening, Bin Man. Good evening, Andy. Good evening, George. Good evening, Demon Landers. Uh, yes, in this love and demon supporting in times of COVID, it's getting a, a bit much, isn't it? really getting me very very nervous um every you know with especially this week with all those players from from other clubs uh you know uh, be, being listed as uh primary contacts of you know, or being at a tier 1 exposure site and having to isolate for 14 days it's making me very nervous that this season is on you know we're on tender hooks here that uh, anything could happen uh, are you boys worried the season could be canned at a- any stage I think uh, with COVID, and we've seen it already this time, anything could happen. Um, Whether we've got players um, not able to play, teams not able to play, I think uh, in all honesty, though, I think the AFL is doing an excellent job of just keeping what we've got. Uh, However um, little that might seem to some people, just keeping it going uh, for the benefit of all. So even though we can't get to games, at least we're seeing it on telly at the moment. But uh, I really do feel for the players and their families and kids and things like that, to, um, what they've got to go through when they get a, when their father or, or friend or boyfriend gets a call to say, guess what, I'm, not, I'm off to on the plane to Sydney or to Queensland or to wherever in the country on really short notice. So, yeah, got to... Got to tip the hat to the uh, AFL for what they're doing just to keep this alive. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I wonder about my priorities, to be honest, when I sort of look at it through the lens of whether I can get to the footy and how it's impacting our run to the finals as much as anything. So um, it did make me laugh a bit that the um, MCC was a, um, a hot spot and, uh, you know, that uh, one of the exposure sites I saw was a rowing club and I thought... <laughs> Like the chalets will be uh, empty this this year for reasons other than us doing well. Um, it, it, it's you know if they did cancel the year, and I don't, I think they're doing everything they can to keep it going. They'll they'll ship it into state if they need to, and barring sort of every state sort of succumbing uh, to COVID, uh, you think they'll find some way for it to go ahead and and continue. But if they were to can the year, what do you think they would do? Would they award whoever's on top of the ladder the premiership would they uh perhaps just play whoever the top two teams are and just get a get bank a game away without any crowd what what do you think they would do be man well, <laughs> <laughs> there is precedent andy and i'm sad to say that from you know that is the ultimate mfc SSS, isn't it that the whole season might be canned but um i think it's probably not worth worrying about in the except if you were a worrying type which there I is am. some precedent and the precedent involves Melbourne uh, the AFLW season was canned after the prelims or whatever that um, the grand final was we'd made the grand final hadn't we we didn't even get to play off on it and they had no, no I don't th- I don't think I think we'd won the first final I don't think they'd got that far down the uh, down the track. But didn't they call that off? They didn't have a winner? No, they didn't have a winner. They just called it off. But with no disrespect to the AFLW, um, and it really is no disrespect to them, I I don't think they would do, unless it... (laughs) 
Uh, I'm just going on precedent. I'm no lawyer. Yeah, yeah, I know. I'm no but... football lawyer, but, you know, using precedent as an example, the one time it has happened in the AFL sanctioned competition, they've said no winner. So Yeah, but I, I don't think there was – would would there'd be a bigger uproar publicly for the AFL and I, I'm just – Not if you're outside the eight, there wouldn't be. But there no, of course not. But uh, I don't know. I think uh, – I don't know. Well, a lot, a lot will depend. I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm relatively optimistic, and so I was thinking there'd be fifty thousand people at the GU last March. So, um, but you know, a lot depends what happens in Melbourne in the next little while. And in some respects, the timing's probably not too bad because um, if you know the numbers are looking pretty good, if you know, with another likely to say another five days of lockdown, there's every chance that we'll get back to zero, which is what they'll need to do. Um, and then they'll have, you know, it'll be probably a slower sort of return to crowds, but a um, bit of luck that, you know, maybe we get to 50% crowds come final time. It all depends on whether there's another outbreak, but you think they'll um, be pretty hard on the borders um, over the next period of time. And, yeah. Um, surely if they did just say they awarded the premiership to the top team, um, being us at the moment, slightly, by a draw. Um, <laughs> it would it, give it, an extra value for this draw that we're going to talk about tonight then, wouldn't it? It, it would, but um, it's certainly, um, you know, the wider AFL community would, would never accept that as being a real premiership. We talked, um, you know, well, we talked, but in general, people were wanting to put an asterisk uh, over last year's premiership, but it turns out that, you know, um, no one, when looking back at, at the 2020 season, despite the shorter quarters and despite the, you know, the hubs and the four-day, five-day breaks, the, that festival of football and, and all that. Uh, I don't think anyone looks at Richmond's premiership and, and has an asterisk next to it. A lot of players said that, um, you know, it's actually harder for them. But if this year they just ended the season and gave us the premiership, surely that would be the biggest asterisk and we, we could never – you know, comfortably claim that as as a premiership. No, it would definitely not get rid of the Norm Smith curse. Yeah, and we wouldn't we wouldn't want it in any case, would we? Because we won't be able to see it. That's true. <laughs> oh yes, um, but that's the the other worry is um, you know obviously we've got finals coming up in you know a month and a half, two months. Um, yeah, I don't know if we're going to be back to, to full crowds. I doubt it. Um, so if they do, if we do come back to crowds at some point, it's going to be reduced crowds and those are going to be very hot tickets. Open up the Ponsford stand, put only <laughs> vaccinated people in there. I've got the solution. I'm happy to trial it. I'm fully vaccinated at both shots. Put us in there um, and um, go from there, I reckon. Yeah, I'm fully vaxxed, so I'm, uh, yeah, if you want to go down the only vaxxed route, uh, let's go. Uh, you have to sit at the top of the Ponsford, though, so. Yeah, well, look, you know, um, th- I, look, I've been saying all along that it was a mistake not to, you know, if they were going to have reduced crowds, then open it all up and really spread everyone out. And I understand the cost-saving benefits, but are you trying to save lives or save lockdowns or are you trying to save a bit of extra money? So you either open it up and open the, the you know, whole stadium up and let the 30,000, 40,000 people really spread out or you're going to just pack them all in. But that's... A, that's just a, on that, I reckon, though, that if, and this is what will come from this, is that, you know, surely there's a chance you get it sitting next to someone, but in the open air, it's, you know, there's, it seems to be relatively unlikely. But they've, they talked about it today that the most likely scenario of people who weren't sitting near each other at both Amy Park and the MCG was at what they call pinch points coming into the um, ground. Or if, at the bars, like the, the Percy Beams bar. bars. Right. Has so been, Percy exactly Beams right. bar has been brought up quite a bit, giving exactly. Percy a bad name. I'm not... Uh, but, yeah. <laughs> but if you had the thing about the... If you use all the entrances, then you would have less pinch points, obviously. So the crowd was only 25,000 people for the G one. So they shouldn't really... You know, if you had all every stand and every gate open... There, and that's how you spread them out. It's probably less about them sitting in the um, 
in the one area, more about um, people coming through the gates at the one time. Yeah, well, none of the AFL games that I've been to this year, uh, that has that been an issue? I guess finals is a different beast when you've got a lot of people coming in at the same time. I remember the Melbourne-Geelong game, I was there. It was packed to get in, and if you look at the pictures from the rugby, it was abs- yeah. getting into the yeah. ground was like it was chock a block, uh, yeah. wall to wall people. Uh, obviously, for just a twenty five thousand of the G, that's that's not the case. People trickling in, uh, but yeah. yeah. All right. Well, let's move on to talking about um, let's talk about our our game. Um, I might just uh, play some audio before I go into my preamble just about um, what was frustrating to me. So uh, here's, a, here's a, some audio about our mindset. What happened there? Jim, you were watching that game. You were covering that game. Mm. What happened in that game? It, well, I've heard you speak about this. It just didn't come across as it meant enough for Melbourne. I, I've, I, walked, well, I walked away. I watched this game, and I felt like individuals had games, good games, but as a unit, Hawthorne played better. So does that make sense? I'm saying? So I reckon there would have been individuals for Melbourne who walked off and go, oh, I played okay, which, which they could. I'll get, a, I'll get a game next week. I, my stats look good, mm. and I, I got through, and it'd be hard to criticise if we're doing some reviews, but I don't think they played well as a unit. Mm. I think- and, and Sorry, sorry Ramon, I think there's a pattern of play of bottom sides which are committed to it because they don't open up and back themselves in it as much as top sides who go, we'll just go head-to-head and we'll get the game a higher tempo. Collingwood and Hawthorne in particular, the way they played Melbourne, they get back really quickly, they block the corridor, and it takes the tempo out of the game for Melbourne, and Melbourne haven't worked their way through when the, the opposition does that. So what ends up happening is the opposition goes, you can have that little short one wide, and Melbourne players will sprint to get it, and that's a nice stat, and, and we'll knock it around. But it actually hurts them up, up the ground. They've got to actually learn to when the, the game is slow, how they can speed it up, or if it's slow, how you can do what's called fast possession. You still take territory. They, they, they've actually better than most sides four to half in the front half compared to the opposition's back half. Yep. Yep. They were pressured a lot. All the on... stats were very nice for Melbourne besides one. The tackle count. Hawthorne had 81 tackles. But so I reckon the contested position was a bit of a lie um, uh, in yeah. that game because yeah. if you tackle me, which Hawthorne were awesome at, and then I'm under pressure and I cough up a handball, and there's a Melbourne player there. <laughs> yeah, you cough it up <coughs> and pick it up. That's another contested possession. Yeah. So it's contested, contested yep. again. But it's not really an effective contested See, position. So uh, let's let's just put Melbourne in perspective here because yeah. I don't reckon Look they're the same team. Been. I don't reckon they've been the same team since about round seven or round eight. What's that? Four so, of eight they've lost. So now? since the Adelaide game. So using the Adelaide game as the first in a, in a sequence of eight matches, they're four wins, three losses, and a draw. So And the losses have been to? The losses have been to Collingwood, the Giants, and Adelaide, mm. and then Hawthorne. No so draw. clearly this is a bit of a, maybe, a, Jimmy, a maturity um, thing against... Maturity. Uh, it is. has to be. Who yeah, they beat? Because it's, uh, it's attitudinal. Because Everybody who else. they've beaten in that time, they've beaten Port Adelaide, Adelaide and beat them comfortably by 31 points at the Adelaide Oval. They beat Brisbane in round yep. 12. Yeah. They beat Essendon, the hottest show in town. Oh, and that's not hard. <laughs> and they beat the Bulldogs. Yeah, but so, again, they're all tempo so, sides who... who all right, I probably went on a bit too long for that, but for me, perhaps most frustrating, uh, it was the most frustrating game uh, of the season to date um, that we've played, um, and not so much because of the end result, which isn't necessarily disastrous or being not great, uh, because we've also failed all year to boost our percentage, and now that the draw sort of takes takes the percentage out of the equation. This match was frustrating because we, we got that 26 points ahead halfway during the second quarter, only to drop the ball, pardon the pun, and we allowed the Hawks back in. And, you know, we then got out to 17-point lead in the third quarter. We got complacent again and allowed them to take the lead. And we then missed multiple chances in the last to go further ahead, blowing our chances to salvage a win. And we'll get more into depth in all of that a bit later on. But our, our pressure and intensity that we've seen all year against the top teams just wasn't there against the Hawks. You know, as evidenced, as they said, by the 81 to 60 tackles, they bought the pressure and we simply didn't. Uh, Bim Man, was, was it frustrating for you to watch uh, watch that, especially on TV when you're not at the game? Yeah, yeah, it was a hugely frustrating game. I mean, I think that was the the point that I was most frustrated in was the um, the getting up by, you know, four goals plus. Um, and in some respects, that worked against us in a weird way, I thought, because 
we hadn't done that all year where it seemed like from that point we coasted a little bit. Um, and after half time, we, they, they lifted their intensity. It was already pretty high. I thought they were terrific. You know, that everyone sort of noted their tackles, but their general, um, you know, it's interesting that they're talking about the, the contest that we might've won that, but they were often beating us around that contest, which really throws our game plan out because as we've talked about, that whole business about us having a, a spare it relies us on winning those contests. So, you know, they talk about the, that that was a big factor is they were winning those contests um, and they're the ones we back to win. So we weren't um, moving the ball as well or defending it as well. Um, but for me, that was the bigger frustration is, is the point you made, Andy, about the fact we've got four or five goals up uh, and, you know, putting the cue in the racks, probably not quite the, the right phrase, but, um, um, to, you know, the second half was you could see their effort, um, uh, Hawks' effort, I should say, um, and, you know, Melbourne didn't match it and there was a few signs of sort of, you know, some players doing some things where they, you know, hadn't done things all year, some selfishness. Um, um, you know, again, it's a sort of thing we've talked about a lot of. It's really hard to know who wasn't doing running, but one can only assume there wasn't the right level of defensive running. People talk about pressure, but pressure really is the sort of measure of a, a whole range of things, as we talked about last week, one of which is the, the preparedness to gut run to cover a kick that never gets to that person to stop. It doesn't get there because you've done the gut running to stop it. So it goes somewhere else. And when Melbourne's fully wound up, that's the pressure we're putting on, um, you know, and we, that just wasn't there. <clears throat> and, excuse me. So it's, it's hard to see who wasn't applying that pressure in the second half. I thought it was evident who was like Viney. I thought was terrific. It's interesting that some of the critique he's got on demon land. I thought, but yeah, it was, that was for me, the biggest frustration is that, um, we got out, we had a good first quarter. Um, in fact, we were flattered a little bit. We were lucky to have the lead we did. Um, and then it was compounded by, you know, the thing that just drives me nuts um, about our poor kicking for goals. Like you've talked about it, Andy, any number of times it's going to cost us this season and it has directly in that game. I mean, the goals, the miss from Pickett and the miss from um, uh, Brayshaw, but neither of them were from the pocket. Both of them were pretty much dead straight. They both should have been kicked. Uh, either one goes through, we win that game. You know, we take one out of the fire and get the win sort of that um, maybe we didn't deserve. But the, the, they were the two most frustrating elements for me. One, giving up the lead. Two, just again, missing set shots. Um, and it, again, it wasn't set shots from difficult boundary. In, in fact, it was interesting and frustrating that um, uh, Frida elected to centre the ball rather than go for goal when he had a boundary line shot. I mean, he's kicked that goal before, so... Um, yeah, that that uh, the uh, kicking for goal was massively frustrating. Um, that last ninety seconds, I, I don't think uh, we should have lost uh, this game when we were up by six points uh, with ninety seconds to go. And Jake Lever has the ball in hand in the middle of the ground. I don't think Hawthorne should have touched the ball again in that game, uh, and it's really that icing sort of a game, slowing it down when, you know, especially these close games is an aspect of our game that we really need to work on because either we chip it around or, or we, should have, we shouldn't have let them touch the ball again and this should have been sort of a set sort of play of keepings off or, or just better, you know, better, smarter play. Uh, no, we, and they would have known there was only a minute or two minutes left to play. Uh, George? Yeah, abs- absolutely. Um, we got burnt in the Adelaide game for the same reason. Um, players not having awareness of the scoreline with respect to the amount of time to go. Um, even that Fritch kick where he, um, earlier on, chose to centre the ball, didn't realise that a point was just as valuable as a goal at that at that time, and that showed out the end of the game. But um, what was interesting about that last 90 seconds, and if people have a chance to, there's a, a clip on YouTube, and I think it might have been on the club website as well, uh, about that uh, the last two minutes, and they played the whole series, and I looked at it a couple of times. Um, I couldn't bear, firstly, yeah, I couldn't bear after, to watch it again. <laughs> yeah. After, firstly, after um, uh, Lever had marked it, he, he kicked it to Max down the line. Um, Jordan was free on the opposite side on his own. And he chose to kick it to Max. Unfortunately, Max had four Hawthorne players to beat, and the ball 
of course, he didn't mark it. And they came to ground, and of course, Hawthorne were back in the race again. They it went back and forth from that point on. But instead of thinking, let's get the ball out, let's do it, let's go for the easy option. Let's get it out there, hold it up. We've got 90 seconds to go. Make make sure it stays in our hands, as you suggested. Um, but it just wasn't it just wasn't smart football in in that in that period of time. But at, even 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 in that last 90 seconds, um, Richo made the, the most pointed comment of the whole lot um, from the boundary line where he said they need to go one-on-one. There's only Fritch has gone back to the Hawthorne back line. You, you're up by a goal. You flood, you flood back. Everybody should flood back. And he said there's two players standing at the other end of the ground. You're a goal up. You've got to stop them scoring. And even, you know, and as you saw, you know, Fritch tried his heart out to, to um, block the, the shot from, um, from Bruce but there was no other forward up there helping him out. All the forwards should have been down in exactly the same uh, role, trying to block the ball from getting getting through. It was it was just poor game intelligence from the from the players. So um, it's happened now, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, hopefully it doesn't happen again. And I, they didn't learn the lesson from Adelaide. I hope they've learned the lesson from this one. I, I take that point about the cross to um, Jordan. I, I'm not so worried about that um, because I guess their game plan is to go down the line and maybe that's what they've trained for and um, and then <clears throat> everyone has to get across it. Probably you're right, it's probably the player. I couldn't see that him open on the telly, but um, I thought it was really instructive that one, he kicked it to Max and Max didn't get it over the boundary line, but then they got the ground ball and that's really my point about the difference in that second half is that they're their effort and their contest and their attack on the ball was better than ours. And that was mm. the, that was the frustrating thing because then they won that ground ball. Um, and then the critical ground ball was the one Bruce got like when, you know, the Melbourne is at our best when the ball hits the ground in our back half. Uh, and he had all the space in the world to turn on and kick it. And he's the last player in uh, certainly their team. He's a great, great kick for goal, beautiful kick. Um, he should never have had that space. Um, but the real problem with that one for me was Lever hitting it back into the corridor. That was a like that was a that was the worst bit of play he did all season, basically. To you know, that's a big no-no to hit it at that time at any point, really. Um, but given the time to hit back towards the corridor, and uh, maybe there was a disconnect. Maybe we should have been there, but the play surely is to hit it as far away to the towards the boundary as possible. So. Yeah, right. That last bit was frustrating. I don't know that I sort of fully agree with um, Bartel. I, I get, I take his point about this period, but they didn't mention at all, which is something that's come up and we discussed, was the loading. I'm not sure whether loading still would be an issue in this game. I don't think so, but it certainly was in the um, Collingwood and GWS games. There's no doubt about that, and the club is as um, and sort of into, or at least Max did, and it's come up in another context that we were loading. So it's interesting they don't mention that, even though it's out there. Um, and and I also don't subscribe to sort of mental weakness. I think that um, you know it's where it's a long season, uh, and I and I, for me, I feel like you know I talked about it last week and the week before the our game plan is a very taxing way of playing footy, and for me, one of the things that came up um, on Saturday night was some of the younger players are struggling. Jackson struggled, made some poor decisions, was pretty, didn't really have a huge impact. I think only eight possessions, I think, from memory. Um, I thought Cozzy didn't play with any zip. And the player that um, Jordan was was not as influential as he has been. Uh, And the player that probably for me was the sort of, that had his worst game almost for the season was uh, Rivers. He looks like he's gassed. Um, and he, in that last two minutes, George made an error too, where he had time to balance up. And I thought he was the one that could have found a shot. Um, it was out on that same wing that um, Lever kicked down the line. He he collected the ball, had time to probably assess his options and, and find a target. All we need to do is at that stage just get a mark. Uh, and he sort of just bombed it long as well. So I just thought, you know, it's important to remember, you know, our list is young still. Um, we've got, you know, I think relatively young list compared to, say, the Swans. It's it's similar to the Swans and everyone gives them a sort of, um, you know, they recognise that. So, um, yeah, I think it was sort of it's a long season and we're right in the middle of it now. So 
uh, I saw someone had posted a comparison of the ages of and experience of Melbourne and Hawthorne, and we were pretty similar. In fact, we were slightly younger and slightly, I think, in, more inexperienced, even though they've had more players. I think they had 10 players with under 50, 50 games of experience, and we've got four or five. Um, we, but, we but it, are, their, their claim was 10 players under 35 games. We yeah. actually had six Okay. including a sparrow in this game. So, yeah, I don't think that was a great factor. Yeah, so in the end, we're age limit, age is, is about the same as well. So, yeah, we yeah. do still have a young, inexperienced team. Um, just before we go on to the, sure. the next point, Andy, just the – I mean, I reckon there's the context for this part of the season and this – I know we're about to talk about the sort of our record at um, bottom four teams, but, Ooh, yeah. um, you know, the – Goody's made a real focus about developing a team that thrives in finals. He, he wants to build a team and a game plan um, that sustains success, but it's built for the finals. And the, the sustained success looks like having a chance at winning a flag every season. Um, and to that end, he will have explored all the different variables that go to helping win a flag. Um, and one of the variables in the last decade, um, one of the variables of flag uh, winners in the last decade is it's only the Hawks um, back in 2013, that could be considered to have dominated the home and away season, um, and they had they won 19 and um, only lost three that season. But they did so in that year. There was less focus and less sort of influence on a system, and they're, pu- they're such a talented side. I mean, they were awesome. That team, their skill and talent was enough to they'd never lose a game like the one that we lost against them. Um, but last year, Richmond, and remembering this was a short season, won 12, lost four. And had a draw in 2019. They um, played. They lost six. 2018, West Coast the winners lost six. Richmond lost seven in 2017, and on and on. So Western Bulldogs lost seven. Over as I said, the outlier there is Hawthorne back in 2009, 2013 was 19-3. So that that's enough data. The pattern is is the flag winners and um, don't win, don't dominate the home and away season. So Adelaide dominated one year in two thousand um, seventeen when um, uh, Richmond beat them, touched them up in the final. They came in short favourites for that grand final. Um, in fact, Richmond's best season in this period of domination is two thousand eighteen, where they only lost four games. They finished on top of the ladder by two clear games and 15% from second. They didn't even make the grand final that year. Um, West Coast won the flag that year, having come second, beat the Pies who were third. Um, and, you know, I think that that's so what, sort of my point is that our, we're tracking very similar to that. Um, you know, we're after 18 rounds, we're two points clear on top of the ladder. We're close to a top four lock. We've got the best list injury-wise in the AFL. Uh, let alone against um, any genuine contenders. Uh, and our win-loss profile is looking very similar to the flag winners in the last um, decade. So, you know, objectively, that sort of means that we're in pretty good shape, I reckon. Um, and then the other thing, of course, in that list that is um, the only team to win a flag in the last, I don't know, 15 years at least um, from outside the top four is the Bulldogs. So we're likely to finish top four. So, you know, I think that they're important context. And in the year... In 2018, in two, sorry, 2017, Richmond um, was sort of that's the most comparable year to where we're at now. Um, they finished, I think, third that year. Not, in fact, in all three of the flags they've won, they finished third. But they got touched up. They got beaten by Bulldogs, Fremantle, um, and St Kilda, all who were outside the top eight. And St Kilda was round 16. So that idea that Richmond rolled into finals and won everything rolling in isn't isn't just isn't true. In round 16, they got beaten one, 138 points to 71 by the Saints who finished 10th or something that season. So, you know, I, I just think we need to be careful of over-egging the pudding about the, these defeats against the lower teams. Yeah, but it's not just, you know, middle-of-the-road teams. And I'll get into something in a minute and we'll play some audio from Goody about the bottom four and his thoughts on it. Um, it's... We've lost uh, two games, two and a half games to, to the bottom four teams and the other team, the bottom team, we got beat, well beaten in the first half and then woke up midway through the third quarter. Um, it's, it doesn't present, I don't know. I, I, but that, but that, I reckon that's the thing. It's not, and Goody will go to this point, so the, is it's the, 
better to look at the pressure those other teams applied. That's the um, the th- the thread that runs through them is that like Richmond, we were pressure side in that Saints game when Saints blew them off the park. This is you know it's like round sixteen. They they got beaten by ten goals plus against the Saints. The Saints were woeful that year. Um, the Dogs finished eleventh or something that year and beat them. Um, so in that in the games we've lost. Rather than looking at where we are on the ladder, the thing to, where the opponent is on the ladder, it's better to look at the pressure the opponent applied. And everyone's acknowledged that Hawthorne applied more pressure than we did. Um, and I've said it right through the season. If we don't play, our game plan is built on that pressure. If we don't bring it, we'll lose to any other team that can match us or beat us. Primary, one of the reasons, because we don't take our chances. We should have won that game by three goals. We should have won the Swans, uh, sorry, the Adelaide game by three goals, and we should have um, beaten Collingwood. We didn't because we missed very gettable shots at goal. Um, and my fear is that uh, teams will take on, and I'll talk about this in a minute, but uh, you know, these bottom teams have provided a bit of a blueprint uh, of how 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 we can be beaten if that pressure is applied. But we'll talk about that in a minute. I want to play uh, this audio from uh, Goody. And Simon, you already mentioned, uh, and sort of half answered this question, I guess, but when you speak about the last month and some of, some of the other losses you've had to teams that, that probably aren't playing finals, is there anything that you can connect with those games that, that feels like a, a trend to you or did not feel feel different? Oh, no, we respect the competition. Um, and I've, I've said this a lot, you know, every team that we play against is a challenge. Um, you know, we sit where we sit because we've been able to execute that for, for a lot of the year. Um, there's no question that our best games have come against the top eight teams and some of the teams that we're expected to win, we haven't quite got the results. But um, I'm not too concerned about what that looks like. What I am concerned about is how we play and become unconditional and how we play week after week. And, um, and that's what builds a really strong footy team. So um, that's the challenge for us and that's the way we've got to operate and that's the way we've got to continue to get better and better. And, um, you know, those opportunities present week after week. This competition is really tough. Um, George and, and Big Man, you can also weigh in too, and I know you want to. Um, <laughs> can you explain uh, why we just can't seem to win, let alone blow away teams that are well below us on the ladder? The teams, I might add, that some of the middle-of-the-road teams have no trouble inputting to the sword. You know, and Big Man, you don't think it's a mindset. I, I think it might be, are we mentally weak? Are we being outcoached? Are these lower-ranked teams coming into matches with the sole strategy of negating us, you know, we're, we're, the, we're the ones that need to be hunted and, and that's working. Uh, is there a worry that the top eight teams might now adopt this strategy come finals time as a blueprint to defeating us? And, and before, be man, before you jump in, <laughs> I'll preface that by saying that, that I believe when we've played these top teams in the past, in the, this year, earlier on, they perhaps haven't gone into the game trying to negate us as the bottom four teams seem to have done. You know, those top teams have come in against us to play their own plan A game plans, which haven't been successful because we've been able to negate them and in turn score heavily from turnovers and their mistakes. And my worry is that the top eight teams will now pivot and adjust their game plans, and we'll see in the next few weeks because we've got a few coming up, that they'll pivot and base, you know, their blueprints, you know, the blueprints of the lower rank sides Um in order to beat us, and I know there's there's a lot to unpack there, uh, but you know, is it the mindset problem, or are we being out coached? We found out by the unlikeliest of opponents, and, and given the key to these top teams, um, I might play another audio. So have a think about it um, about us, whether we've uh, been worked out or not. On Melbourne Kingy, this has come through from a few. <laughs> I just think they don't turn up to the lower sides, but they beat any oh, top yeah. four side, which is an interesting theory, yeah, and well, it's not without merit, it. but it is hugely concerning no, for a team that hasn't done it. anything yet. No, and that's that, that's a valid point, isn't it? And this is the – we all see the game different, and this is the beauty of our sport is that we can sit here and watch the same play and see three different things each. That That's, a, that's why we love it. And a lot, a lot of feedback here coming through about their win over Port a few weeks ago. That's my point. A few weeks ago. So, when you when you get to rounds twenty two, twenty three, first week finals, second week finals, opposition coaches say, "Okay, what did Clarkson do against them? 
What did Chris Scott do against that team? What did what they go and work out what the most tactical, innovative coaches do to bring down the best? And if there's a if there's an opportunity or two, then they they drive a wedge into that crack. That that's that's the game. That's the game of chess in the coach's box. And I've got no idea, no doubt, no idea, no idea. I've got no idea, Jared, but no doubt that um, Simon Goodwin would be thinking, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll probably need to do something a bit different. We can't just – we can't play the same way for 27 weeks and expect a result. This is why Craig Jennings says you keep the checklist. So you identify we yeah. are not winning the flag without beating Melbourne. Mm. So let's be, let's identify their weaknesses and see what other teams do that might be able to serve us when we get there and then you choose your poison that suits your own setup. And that's and we talk about why is the conversion of the minor premiership to the premiership so poor across a decade? That has to be part of it. Yeah. Doesn't it? Is you get studied ferociously by the rest of the competition having declared yourself as the front runner. And let's let's give them some credit. I mean, their top four or five players have had unbelievable seasons, mm. particularly the first twelve to thirteen weeks. You know, how do you stop Gorn, biggest force in the game? How do you? What do you do with Petrarca and Oliver? Who do you tag? What if Petrarca goes forward? What if Oliver goes forward? Oh, they've still got Viner to come back. You know, Langdon on a wing. So there's so many things that they challenged you with that I just feel have come off a little bit. Now, some people are saying that that's that's their motivation or that's their drive against the lesser teams. Hey, we've got five weeks to go. Like the finished line is there. You can see it now. So you've got to hit it as hard as you can. This is when Richmond have always made their run. Now, Chris Scott's, I think, the one missing component in Chris Scott's challenge to be another, a second premiership, a two-time premiership coach has been timing of the run. That's different this year. So it's real. You, you can you can refute it if you like, or you can not allow yourself to see it. But it's happening with Geelong. It's happening. Luke Beveridge changes his team more than any other coach in the comp. Yeah. He does it to keep motivation, to, to keep everyone on edge. There's opportunity here. We're going minimum to a prelim final weekend. Are you with us or not? There's 23 spots. We've got 40 guys we played this year. Yep. So, so they're the sorts of things that are happening behind the scenes. You can choose to not see them. That's okay. But you'll see them at preliminary final round. That's when you'll see them. George? Thanks, Andy. Um, I don't know that Mr. King, who's never coached anyone, uh, really <laughs> knows what's going on in the coaches' minds and certainly at the AFL level, at the high-level AFL teams. Um, Neither do we, I, mind you. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are a lot of observations there and not much else. Um, uh, yes, it's blindingly obvious what our situation is and that's what we've been talking about um, tonight in particular. I'm, I'm going to draw a lot, uh, a lot from... There was a, a post on Demonland today or yesterday from Wiley D talking about exactly this and I think he covered, off, covered everything off beautifully. Um, why can't we beat the low teams? And the first point he made was, well, maybe the coach is hopeless. Um, that certainly can't be the case. Everybody might have noticed we're sitting at the top of the league table at the moment, having won 13 and a half games. Nobody else has done that, so the coach must be doing something certainly right. <clears throat> but he got down to the, the real nitty-gritties of why you get into this situation. Firstly, the, the low teams unpick us. That's what we call being hunted. They look at us and go, what can we do to upset Melbourne? When you come up against, up, up against another high team, the high, te- the high rating teams or the high performing teams don't change their plans. They play the way that they've been structured and, and um, planned to, to attack the game. They don't want to change anything. The worst thing that, that, for example, the Bulldogs could do would be to adopt a more defensive game. Theirs is all about get the ball, run, run in waves. If they change that, they wouldn't be where they are on the ladder, sitting uh, directly below us. The second important point he he made was um, you can't play high pressure for 22 rounds. Um, uh, Bin Man's given us the numbers from when Richmond won their premierships. They were losing four, five, six games out of the out of the um, across the season. You just can't maintain it when you're adopting that style of play, and that's the style of play that we're adopting at the moment. Uh, that's got us where we are at the moment. 
So you can't expect it to be played all the time. Next thing was about risk aversion, which he pointed out was actually a loss aversion. In the high pressure games against the top of the top of the table sides, you have to take high risks because they produce high returns. The trouble is when you're playing a low side, you don't need to apply the high risk game. Um, so what that means is you drop down to their level effectively. You're not playing your best game simply because of your opposition. Your opposition are dragging you down to their levels. You're not playing at your best because you don't need to. If more pressure was brought to bear, then then you'll lift your game. Um, so that that's why um, uh, you struggle against the lower sides, but not so much against the higher sides. And the last one um, was actually there's no rational reason whatsoever for it. We're all just worried about numbers on the board. Um, but I suspect it's got more to do with the, the type of game that we're playing, um, the preparedness that Goodwin has got us for finals-type football where it's going to be high pressure against highly skilled t- sides. We have to have a game plan and a style that fits us in with that. Um, and to finish it all off, I think he said, we will win when it matters most. And if there's a round of football coming up this weekend, we'll find out whether this theory holds true or not. Yeah, so look, some really good points in there. I hadn't seen that post, George. Um, a couple of just that jump out is that, as I've said, I mean, we've modelled our game plan on um, Richmond. There's some differences, particularly the way we defend, but the focus on contested ball, the focus on post-clearance, um, winning post clearance possessions. The focus on full um, team running and in intensity is the same, and it's a particular model that is impossible to do right through a full season. It's just not possible. So psycho- it's also psychologically challenging because everyone's got to be in the right spot. Everyone's got to be there. So you know, if you look at it, Richmond's three premiership years, and last year was the biggest example of this. They regularly their losses if you look at them at least half of them are from bottom eight teams um and to me that makes a bit of sense because if you're going to psychologically drop off a bit and that's the Bar- um, point bartell made is that you know if everyone thinks they're playing or, or you don't um okay you don't really see the drop off if it's only one percent of every player you see it in the end result and i think that you know keeping in mind it was a you know i'm not again reasons not excuses but it was an empty MCG on a freezing winter's night. You know, they, they come off a huge match. And I don't know what bloody David King's talking about. Port wasn't weeks ago. Port was last Thursday night. Uh, and if you look at the losses, so the other thing was the, um, you know, we've come off Collingwood. Who did we play before Collingwood? Didn't we play Brisbane the previous week um, yeah, uh, when Brisbane we lost and, to Collingwood? Brisbane and Bulldogs. That. Yeah, so we come off two huge games where we beat top four contenders. We have a flat game against Collingwood in a game that should have been in the MCG, but at the SCG. We we go to to Adelaide in front of a almost sold out crowd and beat Port Adelaide. I don't know what again what David King's talking about weeks before it was the previous game, um, and then we're hoping for a crowd and we're we're set up for a crowd at the G and we have to play in front of an empty thing. We've got a young team, so for me it makes a lot of sense that they would struggle to get up every week. Um, and they want to get up against the teams like the Bulldogs, and they have so far. So surely that gives, you know, some credit in the bank. And I don't know which team you'd rather be, but Port Adelaide can't beat anyone in the eight, but smash St Kilda and no problems with any team outside the eight. They they thump them. Um, But I'd rather be Melbourne this year than Port. Um, so I, I think that it's overplayed. It's a statistical anomaly. The, the bottom line is that round 18, we're above where Richmond were at this point in the season. The only time the season that Rich in that period the Richmond weren't was the year they didn't win the flag. So um, you know that I think that it's just there's too. It's easy to read too much into it. it it's disappointing that they weren't able to get themselves up. There were some disappointing signs. Um, as I said, I reckon the young fellas are struggling a little bit, um, you know, but again, it, I mean, it's easy to forget an empty MCG with all the stuff that's happening with COVID and all of the things they're worrying about. Hawthorne brought the heat, didn't they? Um, the other thing that just, you, um, George, the, um, you noted is about the top teams and their game plan. Um, and it's interesting in the rest of the press the other clip I was thinking of asking in a play, Andy, was Goody essentially is asked about that and has... 
um, Hawthorne provided a template with these low scrubbing kicks inside and sort of um, negating the influence of May and Lever. Um, and just on that, I reckon May had a, his worst game for the season. He was fumbly, didn't yeah. play well. He paused. If you watch that clip of the presser, he pauses with his sort of trademark sort of um, smirk. And it's like, nah, you know, they've not worked us out. And it then goes on to say that the answer is we'll play our game. We'll let other teams worry about, you know, paraphrasing, we'll let other teams worry about whether they've worked us out. We'll, we'll back our game in. And it's exactly as George said, the best teams back their system in. That's why they're the best teams. They don't bring in the, the scrubby, the heat or whatever. So, of course, the other teams will look at what, um, you know, worked for Clarko. But... Again, for instance, one of the things that they did well was handball through the corridor. When we're on, we don't allow that handball to happen because the pressure's there. So that game part of the game plan's taken away. Remember, we talked about it last week. Port tried it once, and it got through once. So Port, no doubt, if you rain Hinkley as a coach, I know George doesn't, <laughs> um, but why couldn't they take the lessons from Collingwood and beat us at home with those same lessons? So yeah, I just think it's... You know, there's a bit of nonsense there from King. And funnily enough, he made some similar comments to that on the first crack on the Sunday night, shot down by Montagna, just basically said, look, you know, this is um, not unusual for teams to, to go up and down with the way they play. But are you saying that we, you know, in finals, there's no second chance after the first first week? Um if the game plan's not working, if if the team does bring the pressure to us and, and things aren't coming off, uh, do we not have, and it's not even a plan B, but we've got to be able to negate it. We've got to be able to either slow things down or change things for a, for but, a certain amount of time. But the thing is, in the top games, we it's not in all those losses, the one theme is the other team has brought more pressure than us. In all the top games we've won, we've matched against the top um, teams, we've matched it all better than in come finals. There's no way that we're not going to bring the required intensity. The, the issue at hand is whether, why weren't we able to bring the intensity needed to beat yeah. the side? Part of it, I think is, you know, the good teams take their chances. Like, you know, the really good player doesn't miss that goal that um, Gus kicked. You know, he's got a technical flaw. I don't think it's a mental weakness. It's that he's got a shit kicking technique. So he's more likely to miss that under pressure than get it. That's the problem. Bruce has got a beautiful kicking technique and he's more likely to get that goal than miss it and Julie gets it. Um, so for me, the question is why haven't we been able to bring the required intensity in those losses? Not the game plan, because the game plan depends on us being, let's say this pressure meter is being 200 plus. They were 207 apparently, uh, Hawthorne. And I don't know what we were, but I'd be guessing 170, 180, less maybe. Um, so, you know, they brought more pressure in one. Um, but the, that hasn't happened. No other team has done that in the top four. Brisbane didn't, Dogs didn't, um, and Geelong didn't, or, or Swans. Swans were awesome but we still matched them and beat them. Well, you mentioned the the tackling. Uh, you mentioned tackling pressure. Hawks laid 21 more tackles. They had 33 more pressure acts. Um, I didn't think – did you see – Did because the game was broadcast on seven and uh, I, I wasn't aware that the Fox footy pressure gauge was being used. Did you see that at all? Or you just mentioned oh, two I seven. Or... I read it on Demon Land. Oh, okay. that, so the Fox coverage must have had it in the halftime break. Oh, or, okay, yes. Um, yeah, oh, well. Yeah, that was 207. And so the day with 207 at the end, maybe it was at the end that um, I read. I don't know what ours was, um, but they definitely, I mean, their tackling was awesome. They I mean, were ferocious in that second half. That was, you know, the all hats off to them. For, for large chunks of the game, you know, we seemed to be under siege to the pressure that they applied. It forced us to hurry kicks, to rush handballs, uh, and made us look fumbly and sloppy. Um, I'm not sure if that was based on the conditions as well. Um, it might have been a bit slippery, but we certainly looked a bit fumbly, and it could have been because of, uh, because of their pressure. Um, that they're applying. I think one of the other things, though, is that the, when we compare ourselves to other top teams, we've we talked we come back to the pack when we when we're not on because of that issue with our poor kicking. Basically, the dogs played. I don't know either of you watched any of the dogs game against the Suns. That was a pretty average game, a pretty average performance. We would have lost that game because the Suns brought more heat than the Dogs. The Dogs, as exactly as I was talking about um, the previous week, the Dogs um, had enough skill to be able to take their chances when they needed to. 
Um, all we needed to do is exactly as I said, Andy, if we'd got that lead out to five goals as we should have, we should have kicked six or seven goals in that first quarter. We had the chance to. Uh, and, you know, the better, the best teams play average but take their chances and win by two, three goals just like the dogs. Um, uh, the draw, the result, um, putting aside the fact that obviously the four points is, is the better option, how, how does the two points affect uh, our run home uh, given that our percentage was quite inferior to the Bulldogs? It's about on par with Geelong and they'll probably increase it uh, at some point with quite a few games at, at, uh, at Geelong to round out the year. Um, I think Brisbane, despite the loss this week, I think have... Uh, close to us so given that our we don't have that superior percentage we weren't putting teams to the sword it doesn't appear to be our mo uh, we're beating teams by you know 20 points when we're beating them uh, how does the draw george uh how does that sort of affect things it doesn't really affect anything at all if the truth be known um we're still sitting on the ladder um ahead of everybody else um if we win the games for the rest of the for rest of the season, or win a good percentage of them, we're going to be in exactly the same situation because we're two points ahead of everybody else. So it doesn't really matter. It, it, it has, in a certain to a certain extent, taken out the question of the percentage. But the question of the percentage only comes into place if you finish on the same points as someone else. Mm. So we're sitting. Here, if we'd got four points for this game, we'd be in exactly the same circumstances. We lose the next game we're in the same circumstances. So um, it, re- it really hasn't changed anything for us. The question is going to be whether we can continue the, the form that we've shown in the first half into the second half. Um, the, the, the jury's out on that, but let's. this will be the week against the, against the second side where we'll, and subsequently against Geelong in, uh, when we play them. Are we really serious? Are we really contenders? We'll find out pretty soon and we'll find out before finals time. Um, I certainly didn't factor any draws into my predictions that we did in the mid-year review. So uh, now I can officially rip up every single piece of paper that I printed out that day. (laughs) Forty-odd pieces, poor trees. That was 45 minutes well spent then, wasn't it? (laughs) (laughs) Nothing came to pass. The good thing is, is my footy tipping competition awards you a win for a draw. So... um, there you go, oh, even though it doesn't mine, benefit mine doesn't, you. So mine was particularly lousy this week. <laughs> one, one thing about the draw is, that, and I guess it's a, obviously it's a marker of where, how well we're travelling. It, do, it doesn't actually, like it is as good a win to an extent because we would never, the way we play, but also, you know, the, the draw that we've got and the draw that the Bulldogs and Geelong and, and maybe the other teams have got too. Is it unlikely we were going to be able to, Pass those teams on percentage anyway, or get more percentage by the end of the season. So, as George says, it's exactly right. It's sort of it's as good as four points from that perspective. But it's interesting because we didn't lose the game, and it feels like a loss because oh. we should have won. Yeah, we should definitely have beat North on. Um, it's very frustrating that we didn't. Um, you know, really frustrating. But we. But the fact remains, we didn't lose the game. And the, the other thing that's worthwhile having a look at is, is in fact, all the other sides in the competition at the moment. You know, Hawthorne's taken us to the wire. Um, there are a number of other games which similar sorts of results um, were seen. You know, the Dogs were taken within three goals, I think, in, in their game against the Suns. that They should have won by, by miles with that, but they've got the same problem. Um, Richmond um, turned up and beat Brisbane. Um, you know, it's, it's a remarkable change around at this time of year. We get lots of upsets. So for people to be looking ahead and going, oh, that's an easy game, that's a win for you, you mark that one down. Well, I don't think that's the case at the moment. So every win's a win at the moment. It's worth four points. Um, so yeah. uh, don't think that Geelong or Footscray or, or um, Brisbane are in any better situation than what we are. Um, every And as Goodwin keeps saying, every game... Every contest that we come up against is a challenge. Everybody can beat someone else on their on the day. It's such a good point, um, George, about the other teams. It was just two weeks ago in the mid season, or three weeks ago in the mid season um, review podcast that we were talking about who are the challenges, and we thought, well, Geelo- uh, Brisbane, are def- you know, one of the challenges. Well, they've gone back to back losses. Um, who beat them the before Richmond the week before? Uh... 
Oh, going to make me pull out my phone. That's uh, right. <laughs> that's right. The, my so short-term that, memory. A team that's top four um, uh, wants to finish top four. That's, you know, you don't look outside of Melbourne Footy Club when you're us, I guess. But St Kilda. St Kilda, that's right. So St Kilda were outside the eight. Richmond were outside the eight. They've just been beaten by two teams outside the eight. I'm not sure if Richmond were when they played them. And um, certainly no heat has been on them. Uh, not, well, certainly not the yeah, same well, heat as exactly. us. Exactly. Where are the questions? And that game against Richmond was in Queensland when, so they had a lucky luck um, that it was in Queensland. They only had to drive down their, their um, driveway basically to get to the footy. Richmond were late. They were Their bus got caught in traffic. So the game got started late. And so Richmond's preparation was, was, was terrible, um, yet they lost a game that they really needed to win to lock up their top four and get have any chance of a um, or to have some to increase their chances of a home final. So a huge game for them. Um, they've lost Hipwood, um, and so they you know that was a bad loss for them on the back of the loss to the Saints. Um, so you know I, I just think that it's easy just to think about it from a Melbourne perspective, but um, Geelong's a team that that's travelling really well, but you know they'll hit their banana skin potentially before the end of the season. Maybe it'll be against us. So let's hope. Um, just before we go off the sure. draw, just uh, just wanted to ask you fellas what well, you thought yes, about. I was going to should there be a result? What what's your feeling about? Um, should there be extra time or potentially a penalty shootout? Or... Nah, nah. For me, in home and away, uh, certainly not. Um, it, it's, there's always been draws. It's part of the thing. It, 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 you know, it just adds to the ladder, whatever. You get half a point. That's, I'm fine with that. I don't think you need to go into extra time. Finals is a different story because it can throw out the whole – uh, you know, especially in COVID times, you know, might not have many weeks to 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 deal with. But um, yeah, finals um, all for extra time. Uh, possibly, no, I don't like the golden golden goal or golden point scenario. Um, I prefer uh, you know five minutes each way, however they want to do it, and then just keep going until you get a result because you will get a result. Um, but not certainly, never, never. And in particular with Melbourne's uh, set shots for goal, uh, not a penalty shootout. <laughs> I to- totally agree with that, Andy. Um, yeah, during the home home and away season, a draw is the appropriate result. Um, um, in the soccer, for example, they during they have draws during the uh, home their home and away season. So, why should we be any different? So, as Andy said, it only gets to the final that you need a. Um, uh, a decider in the sense of um, what the damage that it could do to other sides. Um, I don't think think um, even in a grand final that um, you need to um, you you really don't need to go to a penalty si- sort of situation. Extra time is the easy one. Um, when I was coaching junior football, that was that was often played, and and football's almost a bit of a, um, a physical. Um, uh, so, such a physical game. It's about who is the strongest, who is the most powerful, and extra time really brings that out. When you when players are really tired, that's when when you start to see the the, the team that should win the game. So if it gets to that point, then just a, just a few minutes of extra time might be ten minutes or something like that. That's fine. That'll that'll usually get you a, a result. Um. If you do want, if you're listening live, you want to join us, uh, 03-9016-3666. That's 03-9016-3666. Or you can Skype us, Demonland31. Join us in the chat room, demonland.com slash podcast. Um, well, Andy, yeah. I'm just off the view. I used to be of the same view as you two. As interesting, Goody was asked that question. He said he'd love to have a win. You know, we played a win. There should be a result. Yeah. And I'm coming around on that just because I I love the idea of a penalty shootout um, <laughs> from the 50 meter line or 40 meter line with a with someone with a goalkeeper. You pick your best five kicks. Um, I think that in the, and do that in the home away, and then the finals do the. Um, extra time plus if you don't get no result at the end of that, the penalty shootout. Well, we'll talk about I just it. Think it. I just love it. Would, the theatre would have been awesome on um, Saturday night. Um, With, without a crowd? Point. Well, <laughs> that would have been even more like theatre then, I guess. But, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, I think there, I think that um, it would be terrific. It would be great um, to, to watch a, a penalty shootout. 
Well, when we talk about our inaccuracy in front of goal in a few minutes, <laughs> um, good for uh, maybe, <laughs> and I, I wheel off a couple of stats about our conversion rate compared to other yeah. teams, you might uh, change your tune there. But let's talk about clearances quickly. Um, I don't think we'll ever get to the bottom, Bim Man, of the clearance conundrum. We won the clearances by seven, 41 to 34. We had a clear advantage from centre clearances by seven. Uh, it was around the ground where we, they got level with, uh, they leveled with us at 25 apiece. Uh, and I'll play some audio from David King and B-Man. Perhaps you can respond uh, when they are done. Hopefully this is the right one. They have the Curiosity Melbourne. That's where we've decided to group them. The missed points against Adelaide, Collingwood, the Giants, and now Hawthorne. Is this... Is this a curiosity or a cause for concern? I think it's a cause for concern. You know, I'm pro- of the top four or five sides, there's a couple of glaring concerns, and one is the Melbourne Football Club and the the way they set up the field. Now, it, it works. What they do works. Okay, the ability to allow the opposition to send their sixth forward up to a stoppage, so they outnumber seven v six nominally against against Gorn, Petrarca and Oliver and Viney or whoever those other guys are at clearance. So Melbourne are a poor clearance team because they're outnumbered. So the ball, more often than not, is going the opposition's way, which is fine because they set up behind the ball with their extra. So that that is always harnessed and manufactured in a way that it's either Christian Salem or it's, or it's Jake Lever. Okay, so guys, you can win it back and away you go. If it gets through that first layer, you've still got Stephen May. So May and Lever control all of that. But it's a dangerous way to live. And I think it's getting worked out. And this is the problem with sitting top of the table for 20 weeks, is that everyone looks at everything you do, and there comes a point in the season where what you're doing is, is tactically picked, picked apart. And, and I think that's what's happening. So the last five weeks, they're two and a half wins, two and a half losses. Okay? Two, two, two and a draw. So what are you seeing? Are you, are you seeing the same thing? I think you are, because they they lowest intercept mark game on, on the weekend in the defensive 50. Five intercept marks they took. Lever took one and May took another, because they said, no matter what happens, this is Clarkson, no matter what happens, they don't mark the ball in there. At worst, we bring it to ground and we fight the fight at ground level, and then the numbers arrive. So they out-hunted them. The, the, the Hawks laid 81 tackles. It was a massive tackle day, because they had the extra at the stoppage. They were able to do that. And then they just took territory. It was ugly at times. It was hack kick forward. But whatever, it, however it went forward, it was not to be marked by those two guys. And I think every team's going to look at this and say, okay, so they're going to give us the ball more often than not at clearance. Don't forget the names in there, the guns. And so, so I can see that being a problem in a, in a preliminary final. So we're talking about what stands up. Can you imagine kicking the ball into a Hawkins 1v2, that's okay. That's fine. You reckon he'd be able to bring it to ground more often than not and then allow Geelong to play? Do that with Jum- do that with um, Aaron Norton. You reckon he's going to bring it to ground? I reckon he's going to bring it to ground. People say, oh, but they've beaten six. They're 6-0 against top eight teams. Yep. But but there comes a point where you've got to put some dates to that. Okay, so they beat Port Adelaide a couple of weeks ago. They beat the Giants, mm, Essendon, Collingwood, Brisbane in a half. When it was really yep. it was really ball movement than 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 intercept work really. They beat the Western Bulldogs. We're talking about round eleven now. I mean that that's a long way back. So I think you've got to live in the last three to four weeks with football. You can't you can't go too far back. Uh, does it really? Does the first twelve rounds really hold any weight now? I mean they've set themselves up yep. and they're in a great position. But I think they've got to allow they've got to tactically allow Gorn, Oliver, and Petrarca to have more influence. By, by at least squaring up the numbers and saying to Lever and May, hey, be great defenders, but be great from a one-on-one start, starting point. We need to have a look at this. We need to shift slightly to go into a finals campaign full steam. Be man. <laughs> I mean, he contradicts himself. That's <laughs> like he said just before about Richmond, you can't play that and that, you know, it's like, and, and also the thing that frustrates me with that sort of analysis is, you don't think Melbourne are also going to be working out other teams and making the tweaks that we need to do? We'll, we'll keep to our template. Um, but it gets down to, like, they can't eat, have their cake and eat it too. You can't say pressure. It's all about pressure. 
and then say we've got to change. The reason why Hawthorne were able to um, to negate that is that we weren't winning those contests. That's what I said at the top, is that we back ourselves to win um, the outnumber at the contest. And as he said at the beginning of his diatribe, is it works. Uh, and it's worked against the best. No top four teams beaten us. Give, give, give me a spell. It wasn't two weeks ago this time with Port. It was last week. You know, it was like the last game we played before this one on the weekend was against a team that's in the top four who uh, we smashed at that ball. So the model isn't going to change. Our ability to go up a level and help and to win those contests is what we didn't do on the weekend because we weren't applying the, the pressure that we need to. So the only time I'll, I'll acknowledge that that's an issue is that if I see a game where we've played our full intensity and pressure and that um, um, issue of bringing or that, that model of bringing a player up to the stoppage clearly doesn't work. Um, but in every game that's been finals-like pressure that we've played so far, that we've brought finals-like pressure, it has worked. So um, that's what, I'll, what I'd go on. Um, and, you know, he, I think he's just he's just sort of grabbing at things, to be honest. It seems yeah, that, uh, that uh, before you go, George, it seems like they're putting more stock in um, – they, they've got their own version of MFCSS um, where they're putting more stock in the games that we're losing rather than giving us any credit for the games that we've won. And he's certainly saying that what happened 12 weeks ago, which some of those games, particularly against the Bulldogs and Brisbane, weren't that long ago and Port Adelaide. Um, yeah. George? Well, and Norton didn't bring the ball to ground. And he didn't Hawkins, get a touch. <laughs> despite the fact that May came off the ground at quarter time, his opponent, he didn't bring the ball to ground and we still smashed him with the intercept. So I don't understand why it suddenly magically would, would change. Of course, coming into the finals, the pressure comes up and his magical bloody preliminary final pressure gauge. But, you know, we've, that's what I said right at the beginning about um, what Goodwin's doing. He, he's trying to create a model that is built for finals. So you don't think that he might have come to the conclusion that I better make sure that if I'm going to have a, um, a, a an extra back and play one less at the stoppage, that the model needs to work. On the weekend, it didn't. That was a problem, despite winning the clearances. Um, we were scrappy. We were under pressure. Our kicks were crap out of those clearances. Is exactly what we've talked about. Who cares if you win the clearances if the next kick is rubbish? Um, they, they compete and they won those grand balls. So when it did get up the other end, Rivers wasn't cleaning it up the way he was. Salem wasn't cleaning it up the way he was. You know, the five intercept marks is one thing, but May dropped about three clangers. He had, as I said, he had his worst game pretty much for the season. So, sorry, George. (laughs) And for Mr King, don't let facts get in the way of of a good story. Um, uh, Lever had 15 intercepts on his own. So um, things weren't weren't really as... as, um, as different as what he suggested. I but think he might have been talking about marks, but yeah, go go ahead. Yeah, 15 intercepts. It doesn't matter how you get them. <laughs> they're, yeah. they're still yeah. intercepts. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. 15, that, that's what I thought. They, got, they yeah. were fantastic back there. Yeah, yeah. And the other, the other thing is, uh, as Bin Man's alluded to, two years ago we were winning the clearances every single week. The style of play was everybody in, go and get the ball, fight for it, get it out, and it, it burnt us. And what we had to do was change the way that our game plan operated. And guess what? We're sitting at the top of the ladder with 13 and a half wins by adopting this particular style of play. We're not going to go back to the to what we were doing 12 months, two years ago, because it simply didn't work. No, and this idea that, that, I mean, what a ridiculous comment that the first 12 rounds don't matter. I yeah. mean, it, yeah. it's just nonsensical. Um, you know, it makes no, makes no sense whatsoever. And he, he, he's... Two weeks, we you know, it was last week or the you know that we played Port. As I said, you know they have a forward, every bit as strong as Hawkins in Dixon. He could not take a more mark. We killed them in um, intercept marking. Why would that be any different? They have Marshall up there, they have um, Georgiatis, and they have Dixon, and they could barely take a mark inside their forward fifty. How's that any different? We've got one. In, in a game that they were wound up about Port because everyone was criti- criticising them as flat-track bullies, at home in front of 50,000 screaming Port fans, they were up and about. Their pressure was right up there. People have said it's our best performance of the year. So a very recent example where us with having one less at the contest has been a huge factor in us winning. So how he could possibly 
say that that's not a factor and suddenly because we were average against Hawthorne, what he should be focusing on is the question that we asked before, is why didn't they bring their intensity to this game? That's the reason why that they were able to do what they did and, um, you know, and beat us up or, or draw with us. Uh, by the way, Lever took four intercept marks and Petty three intercept marks. Uh, he <laughs> was right on May at one, one. But so uh, that's eight intercept marks. It's, it's something that's ridiculous. And then, we, well, I'll go into, I'll talk about defence a bit later. But, uh, yeah, we, we did take a lot of intercepts as well. Uh, let's move on. Uh, delivery inside 50. Uh, George, uh, you could be forgiven uh, for thinking that we had turned back the clock. Um uh, back to 2019 with some of our delivery inside 50. I don't know if this was a result of the pressure applied by the Hawks or, or something else, but just kicking it high and bombing it into 50 just doesn't work with us. It never has. Um, we had eight more inside 50s, eight more marks inside 50s, five more scoring shots, and we'll talk about inaccuracy at the moment, and uh, we just couldn't outscore our opponents. Um, Anyone want to take uh, George delivery yeah, inside? Yeah. <laughs> I keep getting the poison, <laughs> the poison, poison chalice. chalice tonight with these ones. Um, yeah, and I was thinking exactly the same thing, Andy. I was looking at that the number of times um, we were just bombing it long. I don't know whether it's actually because we've got a Ben Brown up there who's two hundred centimeters, who's easy to see. So the old, you know, revert to your your style or or what you learnt in juniors when you've got a big forward like that, you kick it to him. Um, the fact is that doesn't work at this level. Even with a completely depleted um, Hawthorne back line, uh, you just can't afford to play that way. Uh, it was the, the goals that Fritch got, um, uh, I think all of them were from leading into space and pockets and being delivered to him. Um, so, yeah, uh, I, I hope that that gets looked at. And I think the mids um, have got a lot, of, lot to answer for. Um, you just can't bomb it, bomb it long. The uh, contribution of the mids needs to be looked at from another perspective as well in the Hawthorne's mids. Uh, if you just look at the pure mids, not the wingers, they produce three goals, two, and our mids produce two points for the whole game. Mm. Um, you've got the, 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 instead of instead of getting closer to goal, they're, they're kicking it long to the big man. They've got they've got to move further up the ground than what they did certainly in this game, and will be far more effective when they start doing that. And that was exacerbated really by the well, a couple of things I thought is that because we're so focused on getting re-entries, we weren't getting our re-entries because our pressure wasn't there, and they were better on the ground ball gets than us. Um, and you know, because he didn't have a great game. I didn't think Spargo was fantastic. Um, you know, we just didn't really generate enough chances. So, the, you know, there's the going along, which worked the previous week. Um, it has to be said, we didn't do that many. You know, we had, a, it looked very similar. The numbers were very similar mm. to uh, last week. Goody said he was relatively happy with our insiders, just that the ball, when it was a mark, we didn't really do a great job of cleaning it up and getting ground ball gets. And um, I suppose because he got a couple, didn't he? But um, it just uh, it was fairly, you know, and we weren't trapping it in. That was the other thing. So we weren't putting enough pressure on that outlet kick and keeping it in our forward half and getting another re-entry. I, I thought Spargo's uh, kicking into side 50 was probably the best of, of the lot of them. Um but I agree with you on Cozzy. I didn't even know he was playing until he had kicked that goal. I think it was in the third, maybe. Um, yeah, I, I think the thing about those re-entries too is that's when – when you get a re-entry, that's where they often get that little short kick into space where there's someone mm. free because it's a bit of chaos. And yeah. um, if you don't get that, though, um, it just bounces in and bounces that but out like it did in, say, 2019 all the time. Uh, inaccuracy, big bugbear of mine all year. Uh, kicking for goal, in, in particular, our set shot accuracy is abhorrent and that's very costly. It could have cost us percentage this year and perhaps it has cost us two extra points and percentage this week. Uh, cannot be ignored. Something needs to be done to address why our conversion rate is so poor and how do we fix it. If you take a look at the comparisons with other top eight teams, uh, we're far behind the rest of the pack with the exception of the Bulldogs. This was taken off Demon Land at the moment. I don't remember. I think it might have been Titan Uranus. Um, 
this year we've kicked 205 goals and 207 behinds. It's a it's a 49.64% conversion rate. Uh, Bulldogs are closest with a 51.2% conversion rate. Uh, Port uh, best at 56, Sydney 55%, Geelong and Brisbane both 54%. Those 4 to 6% differences... Uh, if you bump ours up, would make a huge difference to all of our results and percentage when it comes out in the wash. And a question I pose to you guys is a time that we bite the bullet engage a, a bona fide, genuine forward coach, and we've discussed this before, to help work on those inaccuracies as well as fix up leading patterns uh, that might fix our forward 50 delivery issues. Um, no disrespect uh, to Greg Stafford, who's a brilliant ruckman, brilliant ruck coach, but he's not a forward, doesn't have the forward mindset. I know there's issues with soft cap and and co- coaches, quota of coaches and all that, but I think this is a really big aspect of our game that's letting us down. And if we want to be a top four team for multiple seasons, not just this year and going forward, I think we really need to fix up our forward entries and our accuracy in front of goals. Um who wants to take this poison chalice? Uh, B-Man, you want to start? Yeah, I, I'm not sure. It would be great, obviously. I'm not sure about the situation, I think, the, with the COVID cap and all the soft cap. Um, we definitely need to improve it. I mean, you've said it right from the beginning of the season. It's arguably cost all of our losses. Um, you know, uh, three losses, 27 points, one draw. Um, you know, we, we with accurate kicking, at least two of those three, three of those four probably we win. Um, and this, the, I think it's probably, you know, it's easy to think, oh, well, we kick from the boundary so often. But, you know, in this game, as I said earlier, there were dead set ones missed from the corridor pretty much. Yeah. Um, and you really just got to nail him. You've, you've, got to, you've got to get him. And I think the problem is a forward coach would be helpful, but it's the tech, technique and, you know, that whether they have time to, as we talked about a few times over the last few weeks, do they have time at this point in their career? Can someone like uh, Gus improve his kicking accuracy at this part of his career? Um, you know, he just needed to kick that goal. That was such a – we absolutely win that game if he kicks that goal. So the game is on his boots. So we can talk about that last two minutes and what we didn't do well um, and those crit- crit- critique that George put forward a spot on but we win the game if he, he kicks that very, very gettable shot. There's not even a crowd to put him off. Um, it, it was still, there was, didn't seem to be any wind or any swell. So I think it's a huge issue for us. The, the problem is, is you know, would a forward coach improve that technique? Maybe. Um, I mean, Williams is supposed to be improving their kicking, um, isn't he? Isn't that one of his jobs? Yeah. Um, it's, it's frustrating, I think, um, for me, um, coming from a basketball background, um, firstly, if people were shooting 50%, they wouldn't be on the side um, in any basketball, at any level of basketball. Um, yet that's what we accept at AFL level, to kick it through. A, how wide's the goalpost? Nine metres or something like that? It's, it's From incredible. 40 metres out, it should be 70%, should not sh- it? Yeah, it should be. Yeah, easily should be. It's the same as, a three po- as the uh, shot from the, um, not from the three-point line, from the foul line. Uh, it should be something that you train and train and train because it's going to happen every single game um, and you should be hitting high percentages. What's the solution? I don't know because every club has the same problem, be it 50%, 51%, 55%, whatever it is. But the sad reality for us this year is, like Ben Man just said, we lost three games by 27 points. Um, Kick one or two goals... Um, that we've put through the points instead of, uh, and we, we'd be sitting on the top with no losses. Um, and it was particularly shown up in this game. The first quarter, um, Fritch missed an easy one for a start. We should have been, in the, instead of 4-4 in the first quarter, it should have been 6-2 or 7-1. Yeah. Yeah. And the game would have been over in that quarter. Exactly, and, exactly. And it should have been 6-1. It, yeah. it was our best. So we were lucky too, I reckon. We were lucky with the way those the uh, uh, rolled for us there. And we didn't yeah. take advantage of that luck. And as you said, that free one was just woeful. It wasn't like any – it was 4-4, four, four, was it? Yeah, 4-4. Four, four. Recolle- my recollection is none of them were difficult shots. No, no. They, they weren't uh, the scrubby points scored because it comes along the ground. These were set shots that we were missing. And this is the, this is the problem. It's not the um, – 
the, the fact that you've got goals and points because most teams will score goals and yeah. points in a 50-50 ratio. It's the set shots that are killing us. And uh, in this game, we had Fritch miss easy set shots, Jackson miss one, Pickett, Brayshaw. Um, uh, I can't think of someone Tom, else. Was Tommy McDonald didn't he? Tommy McDonald missed another one, yeah. yeah. You've only uh, got to hit. Spargo didn't even make the distance from 35 metres. Yeah, and yeah. up the other end, I think they got like maybe five or six goals straight, including four, um, four yeah, albeit four. three of them pretty lucky from umpiring decisions. But nonetheless, someone like McAvoy goes back and kicks it dead straight over the umpire's hat. Well, you know, yeah. you wouldn't back Max to do that, would you? You know, not no. if you were betting on it. So what's the solution? I don't, I don't know. Um, the um, the soft cap certainly has affected things, you know, People forget that Harley Bunnell cost us fifty thousand dollars in a soft cap this year um, that other clubs can spend and we didn't. That that would employ someone at least part time to be able to do something like this. So this is how it affects the club when they get these fines. People forget about these these sort of little things in the background. But yeah, it could be another physio, but it all could also be a, a goal kicking coach. And that's why one of the reasons is that Greg Stafford's in the job is because we haven't got the money to pay someone else. Um, so that's the first thing. But the other thing that to consider is the actual player's EBA, um, where they're limited by the amount of time that they can go at training. Well, um, you can be damn sure that people like just Jason Dunstall and Tony Lockett and Matthew Lloyd um, and all the other great goal kickers would have spent hours and hours and hours practising kicking for goal. Even Brad Green um, when he was interviewed on this demon, very demon pod, podcast, said he'd kick a hundred goals at the end of training. Well, it's not allowed now. Um, so <laughs> serious? Really no kick. I'm serious. Jeez, oh, Siri. Yeah, Siri, Sorry, uh, um, Siri on my computer. I've got to disable that. Uh, just. <laughs> <laughs> wants yeah, to, so, she wants so to the, jump in. <laughs> so the yeah, the, it's not surprising that the quality of goal kicking has gone down, but it's gone gone down across the board. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd be loving to have uh, a Tony Lockett in you know, the last minute of a game like he did uh, with the ball in his hand, um, kicking for goal in a great, in a final. Um, yeah. But I don't I don't think we'll see that quality of of, um, of full forward for quite some time. And they're rare and far between. But they they're, they're like all the good players in any sport. It's all about practice, practice, yeah, practice, repetition. practice. Exactly. And they don't, yeah, they don't get enough of it. But I, I wonder, George, whether I assume this is the case, but you talk about basketball and even at the sort of elite junior level, they use video all the time, particularly on um, everything's built around your free throw shot because the idea is that basically every shot you take is the same from no matter where you are. You might adjust the speed at which you release and all of those things, but you get your foundation right from the free throw line and they video kids from every possible angle, hundreds and hundreds of shots, and then they analyse it. One of the interesting things on the Fox coverage is that they have the, um, the record from any given spot on the ground for particular players. Uh, and often uh, it seems like a player who might have 10 shots um, from that spot, um, six will be to the, um, you know, to one side. It's quite, you know, they make the same error every time. They hook it or they, they fade it from that spot on the on the ground. And you watch them go back and kick it and they, they do the same thing again. And surely, you know, that they're looking at that video. If it was golf, for instance, or basketball, they would be analysing all of that video and saying, well, look here, you're dragging your foot across or, you know, um, you know, presumably they do a, a bit of that. Um, the issue, of course, is, as you say, the amount of time they can put into it. But geez, if I, you'd hope if you're an AFL player, you, you, wouldn't you get someone to do it on your own time? Yes, is the answer to that, <laughs> um, if you wanted to be serious about it. But um, it doesn't seem to be happening across, like I said, across the ball, the board, the fact that so many teams have got players kicking mid-50% um, is just incredible. Let's move on. Uh, George, uh, in your review of the match on Demonland, and uh, just wanted to thank you once again. Uh, if anyone listening who uh, doesn't get to read George's uh, match reports, uh, do yourself a favour each week. I post them down on um, 
on on Facebook, on Twitter, and uh, on the Demonland website. Uh, go check them out, and uh, it's remarkable how quickly you get them to us, particularly after a loss. I've thrown my phone out the window, and then <laughs> then I see uh, see you've uh, d- already done a match report. So thank you very much. Uh, you, you highlighted that we did some strange things in terms of time on ground to certain players. Uh, do you want to take us through that and uh, perhaps what it meant for for uh, the result? Well, I don't know what it meant because I don't know what's going on at the moment, which is very difficult. Um, early on in the season, um, we pointed out on this podcast that um, certain players were playing high percentage time on grounds, which released the um, other players to have a break, particularly the mids and things like that. Um, but what I'm starting to see is um, as we get to the, towards this end of the season, those same players are now reducing their time on ground. So I'm not quite sure what's going on. So using Max Gorn as an example, against the, against the Saints um, early on in the season, he, he played 94%. GWS the first time, 95%. Geelong, 93%. Uh, the Hawks the first time round, 90%. And yet on the weekend, he's down to 83%. Now, that might not sound much, but it's about 10%. 10 minutes off the ground if you say it's a 100-minute game. So 10 minutes off the ground. And I thought, well, may- maybe he's letting Jackson have more time um, trying to build him up, you know, in anticip- anticipation of finals. But again, in those same four games early on in the season, Jackson was 80%, 91%, 93%, and he's down to 76% at the moment. So... I don't know what's go- I don't know what's going on, particularly with the mids. We didn't play what- anyone else in the in the ruck, as in no, uh, centre no. bounce ruck. No. Yeah, that, that, and that's why I, I can't work this out. And I'd be pleased if either of you guys could guide me into this, particularly when um, you know supposedly both the rucks are either spending more time up forward or more time back. I would have thought the time on ground would have at least stayed constant or maybe even increased. Um, rather than pure rucking roles. So I don't know what's going on. What really surprised me was Charlie Spargo, who um, only played 64% of the game, which means he, you know, in a 100-minute game, he's got 36 minutes off the ground. It's just astounding. And while his output was, was great in terms of delivery into the forward line, thing, I think he had seven score involvements because he was able to hit people on the chest unlike others. 64% for someone who's a small forward. It's not surprising that our pressure down the forward line wasn't as strong as what it was. So I don't know what's going on there either. So over to you guys. If you can give us an answer or somebody in, in the chat room can give us an answer, I'd be pleased to hear it. Well, I wonder whether, George, the um, given the team's so settled and there's been so few changes, um, whether um, it's really part of their load management and they're, they're looking at... Um, you know, their, their training loads, which we know that they um, put in extra training loads over the, the buy period um, and that um, maybe this is an extension of that. The um, you know, I, I know that Burgess controls all of the um, time on ground from what I understand. I think that's the case. Yeah, he's, he, he's the interchange man. Yeah, and I think he monitors the time. Um, and so I, I can only, my guess would be it's all related to their loading um, and that, you know, they combine that with what sort of um, training they're doing off track on the, the track as well. So, um, you know, that would suggest to me is that they're, they're giving a player like Spargo a chop out. Um, and with the Ruckman, the Brown did a fair bit of the um, forward ruck and um, in the forward line and so did um, T-Mac. So they pretty much split it. So they might be thinking, look, Jackson, who is looking a bit tired, let's give him um, a chop out. Max needs a chop out. Spargo is uh, he plays a particular style. It's really ballistic. Let's give him a chop out. Um, let's use the bench um, as our way of managing training loads and how much kilometres these guys do, with a view to making sure we're as fresh as possible with our key players or across the board. Maybe they're, they're managing that load across you know all the 22 players that are playing each week um, with a view to being cherry ripe come finals I think and, you know that might well be a factor in our performance yeah I, th- I think you're spot on uh, with that and I'll go one step further I think that they were also anticipating we were going to be playing in Darwin uh, this week and I think they were anticipating that too we're going to be playing in you know sort of energy sapping uh, humidity uh, we, we were going to be playing so that would have been a view to that and I'm sure and I'm not saying we we're taking either Hawthorne or 
Gold Coast lightly, but yeah, I think they're probably managing those loads as well as anticipating for what would have been the round 19 game against the Gold Coast in Darwin and then looking at coming back and playing the Bulldogs in round 20. Um, that's, of course, all gone out the window, that planning. But, I, I George, I reckon that uh, is probably spot on to, to the reasons why you saw those time on ground numbers differ uh, this week um, as opposed to what's been happening. And, yeah, it's definitely got to do something with loads and... Um, yeah, the, the upcoming fixtures or the what were the upcoming fixtures uh, just a few days ago, Excellent. even a few hours ago. Excellent. That makes that makes sense to me because I was sure as hell confused about what was going on. And it's interesting, George, because the you've been right on the the um, time on ground all season, and Burgess is pretty um, um, clinical apparently. And it's interesting because you know that I saw on Demon Land well. You know why didn't have Spargo? You know, given how effective he was, he was our best kick inside fifty. What what's he doing playing so little game time? And maybe that's a discussion between Burgess, who's on the bench, isn't he? So he can yeah. directly who Goody. Um, but you know they they pretty carefully um, and particularly him calibrate the amount of um, distances they travel. And it's the one bit of data that I don't know that you can get anywhere. At least I don't know. I'd love to get hold of it. Is the amount. The, the kilometres each player run. I know there's you can get bits and bobs through the um, media, but um, I've never seen it published the whole team and the clicks that they run in a match. Um, and so I suspect that they know exactly why they where their GPS things in the game and in training. He would know to a metre how much running each player does and would be carefully um, looking at each player's load with a, again with the view to being as fit as possible come finals time. And we're in a unique position um, as to be able to manage that because we've had so few injuries. So I guess there's two competing things is um, Beveridge has gone completely different and they talk about him. He's They've had a lot of players come in and out of that time, that team. And, um, you know, they talk about that being one of Beveridge's sort of, like I think even King mentioned in one of those clips that, Beverage does that to keep them sort of mentally fresh and motivated. Well, maybe that's more actually to do with the way they load, uh, manage their loads, um, that they're better off not that playing. And, you know, someone like a Johannesson might go off and have, you know, no um, running in the match because it's hard to manage. Um, maybe we're, we're, we've chosen a different path. That that makes that makes sense as well because we see Geelong resting Rowan and uh, uh, Selwood uh um, at this point, so yeah, the other, the other option is rest your players for whole games or reduce their loads during the game. So yeah, that makes makes some real sense. And I'll bet I don't, I can't, the the previous week against Port or, or or sorry, David King was it six weeks ago? I can't recall. <laughs> um, um, we probably all gun blazing with all of our best players on the field at maximum intensity all the time. Um, because and I'm guessing that that'll be the same. I, you know, I reckon Spargo won't be. What did you say he was? Fifty six, sixty four percent. Yeah, he won't be sixty four percent against the Dogs this week. Um, I was just going, going to rattle off first um, stuff about our defence. I don't think we really need to go into depth about it, uh, but it, was, it just goes against uh, what. Uh, was it David King uh, talked about our defence? Statistically, our defence held up well. Lever, Petty and May affected 11, 6, 11, 7 and 6 spoils and Lever and Salem had 15 and 10 intercepts. Um, uh, I don't think, I mean, look, May didn't have his best game. Uh, we usually do so well against teams when, when springboarding from defence, but I don't, just don't think it was there this week. Um, you know, that, um, that uh, you know, those turnovers uh, that we usually do so well in scoring from turnovers, it, it just simply wasn't there uh, this week. But uh, we still were getting uh, those intercepts and spoils. Um, and Rivers, I thought Rivers, as I said, was a bit flat. Salem was good. I thought um, Hunt was good, and I thought he's been good the last um, two, three weeks. And, you know, I think that, the yeah, the defence was fine. And, again, with this whole idea about teams working us out, they only scored 79 points, and they kicked 12-7 to our 11-13. We had 24 scoring shots to, you know, their 19. So, um, you know, they were pretty accurate on the night. 
um, and took their chances. Um, but still, 79 points on a night where it was pretty good conditions um, isn't a huge... It's not like they've picked us apart, have they? It's only been um, Adelaide, isn't it? The, and no, 96 points, I think, Adelaide were. But so no team's even um, broken 100 against us. No. Um, I will just... How do you how do you guys see Vander's game? Uh, it was his first game for the season, I believe. Um, I thought he did all right. Yeah, um, you know. Yeah. I think we got we got exactly what we expected out of Vander's um, being his first game, and um, while he's he, he's played, I think it, I th- was it his first VFL game the week before or maybe his second? He had played that game against Essendon. I know that yeah. we played a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, he, had, he hasn't had a great, since. either way, at VFL or AFL level, he hasn't had a great deal of on-ground time. Um, it, I think he ran out of puff quite a bit. Yeah, um, that's what I thought. He had 65% um, game time. Yeah, yeah. Um, so It um, was a please, yearly game, I thought. Yeah, pleased with what he did. A couple of really telling um, inputs, um, but that's what we expect from Vanders. He's, he's a, a a battering ram, a shock troop uh, that you don't use all the time on the ground. He, he can't maintain that um, for long periods of time. But but boy, he's nice to have up your sleeve, uh, particularly as you get towards finals, because uh, as we've seen in finals, it comes down to some really critical, contested situations. And to have someone like he did, in, we all remember the 2018 uh, game particularly against Geelong, um, he he cut cut them apart a couple of times simply with his strength and ability to to move through packs that others couldn't do. So, yeah, he'll be a nice uh, shock trooper to have uh, sitting in the back pocket. And just on that, George, I mean that's goes back to that discussion about this idea of having um, an extra back and one less at the stoppage. He's the sort of player who's going to beat two players in the final mm. just because of his strength, and he did it a couple of times in this match. Um, so I, I think that, you know, we talked about it. They like him in, come finals time. I thought he's, he moved pretty well. I agree. He seemed to run out of puff, but he moved pretty well. And uh, a couple of neat kicks too, I thought, as well. Yeah. All right, let's uh, let's talk about um, this week's game. Uh, now well, I can throw all my notes out that I've got in front of me because we're not playing Gold Coast, uh, even though I knew that we were likely to be playing um, uh, playing the Bulldogs anyway. But um, uh, changes, uh, no reserves at the moment. Um, Harms, what did he pull out for? Uh, an ear infection or something? Ear uh, infection. Can, can you see yeah. him coming back into the team? Um, who comes out? Plus who are we playing? We're definitely playing. Yeah, yeah, Bulldog. it's been it's been announced Saturday night, seven twenty five at a vacant MCG. Mm. Right, God, it bloody Jesus wept. I mean, um, the AFL have had two top of the table clashes this year, and both of them are going to be in front of no crowd. And Melbourne Hawthorne is a big drawing. We had fifty thousand or forty thousand people at the first game we played this year, didn't we? At the so we've missed this. I know oh this one was, was only forty thousand. Would have only have been for forty thousand if we got yeah, everyone. Right. So we missed yeah. this one. We've got this would have been a big crowd, of course, with the, obviously um, um, the pies game. So it's been a horror, really, hasn't it? But uh, yeah, it's an interesting one. I, he doesn't uh, he doesn't like changing winning sides, but we drew. Yeah. So <laughs> maybe yeah, he makes a maybe one change. change. Yeah. And I, I think the important thing to remember about Harms when he went out, basically uh, Viney had come in. Um, so, again, you, you who, who do you take out of that midfield group if you're going to put Harms in there? I, I think Viney does as well in the tagging role as what Harms does. Um, and I wasn't impressed with the late, last game that Harms played, whether he has an ear infection yeah. or not. Um, he, he, he was way off the pace and his... Uh, he, he wasn't sure when needed. Um, he was fumbling. Um, you need to show more than that, particularly uh, when you've got a Jack Viney sitting out there waiting to come in. Viney's just as equally important to us. How, how many tackles did Viney have in this game? Oh, huge 10 or 11? Or... Yeah, yeah. How, um, how did you see his game, you guys? Um, the, from my perspective, I think the, the kicking let him down. Um in a couple of cases, um, particularly kicks into the forward line. 
uh, one where he kicked it directly to a Hawthorne mm. player sitting at centre half back or somewhere along, yeah, along really those lines. If yes. if he um, and maybe that's that's a um, more of the I haven't played much with this mm. side. Uh, because the last time I really played with them was we were adopting a different game style. I think it's um, more he's just a rubbish kick. <laughs> well, yeah, that, that's the other possibility. I'm giving you a bit more, <laughs> bit more credit than that, but he's, he's still a rubbish kick at the moment. Um, but, yeah, uh, once again, it shows the um, importance of being able to kick the ball accurately and at the right time and giving it the correct weighting. He's not very good at that. So, okay, the, uh, that's the thing, isn't it? The, the weighting to – he kicked two inside 50s where we got a beautiful – clean clearance out of the centre uh, and he weighted both of them the, that I'm thinking of to their advantage and our disadvantage and they both got picked off. And um, But having said that, I thought he was fantastic. Uh, and yeah. Did you see it that way too, Andy? Uh, my problem with Jack Viney is that he often tries to do too much and gets caught um, gets caught quite a lot. Uh, but, yeah, I, I wasn't as critical of him as some of the people in the match day uh, thread uh, were um... yes, he got interestingly he got two coaches' votes. Hmm. I'd be curious to know what the split was, or was it Clarkson, or who gave him the two votes? Yeah, you can. I haven't had a look. You can sometimes work it out depending on what the other uh, the other ones were, but don't know. Um, so, so the... I can't for changes. I, I, I think they'll go unchanged. That's been the pattern. No one played so badly. I would still worry about the, you know, is it getting too late? To, I mean, really, playing the dogs, they're going to want their best twenty-two out so that out there, so they're not going to be resting anyone. Um, but it does worry me about some of these young players sort of feeling the pinch a bit, um, you know. So, uh, but you don't really change it now. This has suddenly become it's brought it forward, hasn't it? So this will really challenge their planning and their. I guess their psychology, same for the dogs, a similar, similar similar boat as us, obviously, in terms of that. Playing again in front of a no crowd, same deal as the first time we brought the energy in that game. They didn't. They will be looking to to turn that around. That would have stung um, that, that loss. It was a bad loss, probably their worst loss for the season, not that they've had many. Um, so, you know, I can't see that they'll make any changes. And, Personally, I, I agree with George. I wouldn't. Uh, I thought Harms was average. Maybe his ear was causing him problems. If his ear infection, maybe it had been around for two or three weeks. I don't know, but um, yeah, I'd I'd, I'd like to see um, Vander stay in there. I, I again wouldn't be shocked if Melksham comes back in. For who, I don't, I'm not sure, um, but I, I suspect that they'll want Vanders and Melksham in the in our best twenty two come finals time. So they played, um, they also are going into this match uh, not having played in front of an empty stadium but from the beginning of the year. They did uh, earlier on, you know, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but we've played, we've got that practice under our belt <laughs> of, of an empty stadium. Um, an empty MCG. They played us at an empty stadium. Yeah, yeah, I'm saying uh, yeah. that was a couple of weeks ago. But they played, yeah, right. previously they played Sydney and then last week they played, or oh, this Past week they played at Metricon yeah. in front of a crowd, that's a, so yeah, that's a, that's the same as an empty stadium. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I'm surprised. I had a look at a couple of the um, Metricon stadiums. There, well, they have four games there this week, and really, you'd think. Uh, uh, I guess there's a lot of expat Vicks. You would think would want to get down there. The, all the games uh, were pretty empty there. Um, you know, for you know people that don't get to see. A lot of footy uh, every second week, maybe um, get four games and no one turns up. Yeah. Any changes from you, Andy? Do you uh, I don't think there. Oh, well, I, I don't think there will be changes. Uh, if there's no one injured, uh, I, I doubt. I doubt we'll make any changes. Um, we've had yeah. a great run with injury. Yeah. Well. Mm. Yeah. I held my breath with Petty. Um, he didn't. It yeah, didn't look good. Looked like, looked all the world like a hammy. Didn't. Uh, it looked like he'd pinged it for sure. Uh, which would be two, three, four weeks, um, depending on the severity. Um, so hopefully he pulls up all right during the week. Um, but yeah, I, 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 you know, given that we've got no reserves probably for the next couple of weeks, uh, it just worries me a little bit that uh, if we do have some injuries, um, and I guess all clubs 
Um, well, not all clubs because some have their, you know, some of the interstate teams have their resis going, but um, all Victorian clubs anyway won't be uh, won't no. be having any resis. So, but won't be getting injured though. We've missed quite a few because even when early we had buys and you know, we were sort of our team, uh, Casey was impacted a, a bit more than some of the other teams uh, in terms of amounts of games played this year. So um, yeah, coming. Into the finals, uh, not a lot of players have had uh, game experience in in the one, so could be a worry. The, the other the other thing is, even when you looked at the uh, that last Casey game that we did play, that there are a number of role players ready to go. Yeah, you know, um, Joel Smith was quite quite good in the in the back line. You had Door in the ruck. Um, you had Wiedemann up forward. Um, Plenty of uh, Whip Vandenberg played well in the midfield. Melcham played well. All these players are ready to ready to go. Um, <clears throat> they're all ready to slot into a position. Should we get any any injuries? It's not like uh, what do we do if if Ben Brown falls over? What do we do if if uh, Jackson falls over? We've got someone sitting ready ready to take their place. So uh, even though they haven't had a great number of games, I think they're well and truly prepared for that scenario. Which again is like um, I find David King so frustrating because I've actually been listening to him more this year because I've been watching that first crack and and occasionally listening to the replay of that um, thing he does with um, Jared Waitley. But he he's been for the first half of the season he's been banging on um, all about how important uh, injuries is and that's the uh, that's the biggest factor and it's your twenty first player blah 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 or twenty third player and. You know who's got a better injury list than us? So it, it's sort of funny how things sort of drop off the the agenda a little bit. Um, just a question for you two guys: what What do you reckon of the psychology of us having to play um, uh, the dogs this week as opposed to next week? Is it a negative? Is it a worry? Is it a positive that you know that we get to rebound straight away? W- will have it mucked up their planning? Look, I think it would have marked up their planning in terms of what we were talking about a few minutes ago. I reckon they probably definitely had a, a plan going into the game against the Gold Coast, uh, particularly if we were playing in Darwin in terms of loads because of the, the weather there. Um, it would have been unlikely if if that we were going to be playing in Darwin given the situation with with uh, with us being able to with Melbourne being able to travel there. Um, so it probably likely would have been played at the Gold Coast. Um, so. Uh, that changes a little bit, but I'm actually happy that we're going in against the Bulldogs because I think we might have fallen victim to to Gold Coast and and our complacency against our bottom four uh, or bottom six teams. So uh, yeah, let's bounce back against the Bulldogs. Happy with that. Yeah, I, I don't think it'll really affect us at all, it, and and it'll provide it, the coaching staff the impetus to. Um, uh, to, to bring the players up to the levels necessary in finals um, um, a little bit earlier, perhaps, than what they were planning on. But uh, yeah, you're going to you're going to play a decent side this week. Um, it it really will show us where we sit. Um, so yeah, um, I don't think it's going to affect us in any way. It is a big advantage to us um, not going to Darwin. Uh, Darwin is particularly hard to play. Um, at this time of year because of the humidity, um, unless you actually experience it. Um, I've never seen players sweat so much in a game as, as you do up in Darwin. You don't get a, a real appreciation for it on, on the uh, on the television. You don't get an appreciation for how wet the ground gets um, once the sun goes down. Um, so playing at the MCG on a nice cold Saturday afternoon, as it's probably going to be, um, I think that more suits us um, in terms of preparation and the run into finals. I suspect we might actually finish up in Darwin or Alice at some point in in, in the future, but um, not just this well, week. Well, do you think uh, we'll probably play the Gold Coast the week after? Where do you think that game will be now? Keep in mind... Um, Keep in mind that we've got West Coast the week after. We don't really want to be going to Darwin and then Perth. Um, yeah. Because we're we'll, on the Gold Coast for sure. There's no way they'll go to, there's no way the Northern Territory government will let, I mean, we'll probably be extended till maybe next Monday, Tuesday here for the lockdown. That I, I can't see the Northern Territory lifting their 
the restrictions. And, so. All right, so Queensland let us in. We play there. What happens? Because we have to then fly to Perth and quarantine in that resort uh, that's, I think, just outside of Perth, what all other teams are doing. We're allowed to train. Uh, and uh, that, which wouldn't be a bad thing for the team. As a travel, bit of a travel. Uh, yeah, bonding. I reckon that um, there's a uh, – so I'm not – that question, I'm not really sure whether – I think they'll love the fact that they, they get the dogs this week. But it, I, I think there's a real – we've been lucky with the way things have happened with the COVID interruptions. We haven't been too hard hit by them, apart from the financial aspect. We got moved around with the Sydney, but um, we still got that game away. Um, but it's definitely better not travelling this week because they're better being in Melbourne. It's hub-like anyway. We're in lockdown. They can still train. They get. They can go about their business, but they can. You know, they don't have to get on planes and doing all of those things. So they can really sort of focus this week without the without the thing in their mind. Oh, we've got to travel on Thursday and all of those. You know, the things in the airports and all of that palaver. They don't have to do that. They'll have to do that the next week. But then, if they link it up to a t- trip to Perth, they can make that a, a little bubble um, and use that time to really psychologically reset. Um, coming into the lead up to final, so that, I reckon that's perfect timing. And particularly if we play at Metricon, which will be uh, their home ground, presumably that's where it'll be. Um, we play well there. Um, we we know the ground, um, you know. So I think that it sort of actually works. The timing of those uh, that that change, staying in Melbourne, travelling there, and going to Perth will, will could work really well for us. In, in fact, you know, just taking the Northern Territory situation out of it means, uh, you know, one, what is it, four and a half hours to Darwin trip either way, so nine hours away from the whole scenario. We, we're going from, at the very worst, from Melbourne to Gold Coast back to Melbourne to Perth. That's not as bad as Melbourne to Darwin, Darwin to Melbourne, Melbourne to Gold Coast, Gold Coast to Melbourne, and then Melbourne to Perth. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and it might be that we just fly and fly out for the Gold Coast game, in which case... I suspect we will, yeah. Yeah, in which case that's not such a big drama at all, really, is it? Because yeah. they, they sleep in their own bed and then they get ready for the trip. So they'd have to turn around to go to Perth pretty quickly, I think, because as Andy, as you point out, Andy, they have to do a seven-day... At this point, they will have to do a seven-day um, quarantine. Yeah, I think we'll probably play a Saturday afternoon, like like um, St Kilda did. They moved the game. Our, our game got moved from the daytime. They played at one twenty-five or something, or one thirty, um, and then went straight to it. So I would assume we'll probably play a similar thing. We'll probably play a, a midday. Um, well, when are they playing? When is St Kilda playing? Um, West Coast. They're playing on, on Saturday night, so we'll probably play West Coast on a Sunday maybe. So, yeah, we can probably play even a Saturday night and then go straight over. Uh, I don't know if they'd do, go back to Melbourne or go direct to Perth. Yeah, they'll fly. Yeah, they'll come out the same day for sure. They'll get the red eye if they can fly it. Yeah. Just George said that Saturday afternoon, this game's Saturday night, um, which I reckon suits um, us if it's a little bit slippery because um, Norton's back in the team. He played last week, didn't he? Yep. Mm, he did, and they've yeah. got the, the young um, gun number one. You yeah, tomorrow. so, you know, slippery night. They want to – that's going to make it harder for them to mark and to, you know, use their strengths up forward. It's going to be harder for them to use those little flippy handballs when it's a bit slippery. Um, and it's interesting, um, just uh, the, the, the thing, uh, that, that game, the sports bet have got that at $1.83. We're at $1.83 favourites, and they're um, out to 201 slight outsiders. So it's interesting that, you know, an objective market like that has got us as favourite, despite all the David King talk about, you know, the first 12 rounds not meaning anything and the Bulldogs are everyone's favourite team. You know, when it comes to cold hard money, that'll probably even up, and it'll probably start a dollar ninety. Both, I'd be guessing. Um, but you know, I think that's a good evidence of um, you know where we're currently sitting form wise, despite the fact of drawing against Hawthorne. I think it was interesting just talking about the Bulldogs and, um, and Eugel Hagen coming in. He kicked three goals this week, um, the very week that Norton returned to the side. Um, we were talking two weeks ago about the value of Ben Brown in the side and how that suddenly releases other players. I think this was another good example of that. When you've got Norton and Bruce taking all the heat, someone like Eugel Hagen in his second game of AFL football suddenly pops up. And Yes, he's going to be a brilliant player, but uh, when he was asked to play the number two role the previous week, 
he was a little bit at sea, he just didn't get the opportunity. So uh, from our perspective, yeah, the big Ben Brown up forward makes more than just a difference um, from the number of goals he's kicking. It's what he does for the players around him. Yeah, yeah. And isn't he, um, did you see any of that game, George? Yeah. Isn't yeah. he a beautiful kick? Oh, he's just magnificent and, and a fantastic mark. Just clean, absolutely clean, great leap. Um, yeah, just a, a brilliant player. You can see why he was number one draft pick. Yeah, that's a pretty good thing, pretty good present to unwrap it around, so who do you, around 17 of the season. Who do, we, yeah. who do we line up on a player like him? Vanderberg. <laughs> <laughs> Bit of the Jack Watts uh, first game treatment. <laughs> a bit, a bit, it's a it's a different scenario um, um, compared to that game. It's who, uh, our defence doesn't operate player on player. No. So sometimes you'll get Petty, sometimes you'll get May, sometimes you'll get Hibbert. Um, it just depends on on uh, who's in the area at the time and the way the structures are being set up. So yeah, it's not a case of like like we all used to and were brought up on the old. Who sits on him? Who plays on him? Who's the back pocket? Who's the centre half back? It doesn't operate that way these days. So, yeah. yeah. And the key for him and the key for Norton, I think, is actually not their pack marking. And you yeah, know, pack marks don't get taken very often these days up forward. It's you, they've got to clag up the space for both of yep. them, so they've got no channels to run into because yeah. both of them are brilliant out in front of them, particularly Norton. Um, you've just got to make sure he's got no space to run into. And that's where, yeah. as you say, George, that's where the, the zoning off and the getting in that hole and the rivers and Salem's to drop back in the Langs and, and, and Gus to, to make that difficult. But, but that's all, again, you know, it's sort of the same story. If It's all about that kick in. If that's unpressured, then they'll kill us because, yeah. you know, he Norton's a total star. He's an absolute yeah. gun. Uh, if he gets good, um, you know, if he gets clean looks, Players are, are kicking under no pressure from 70 metres to him on a lead, 20, 30 metres, they'll, they'll kill us. And, you know, and so this game sets up, we talked about it way back at when we first played them. I, I love this, the, um, these two teams because they've got such distinct styles and, um, you know, we know what um, we want to do to them, which is to make it really hard for them to transition. We'll, we'll look to do much better than um, we have been in terms of our centre clearances, even if that means that we, um, you know, we're less focused on the round the ground stoppages. We will make it to, you know, most of all, make it super hard for them to move the ball across the ground and, and transition. We'll, we'll allow them to, um, to take us on. They'll have at the G more space than they did at Docklands. Um, and, you know, they'll hopefully back themselves in and it'll be, a, you know, a, they're a great team to watch when they're on. But that game, I'm not sure if you saw either of it, uh, you guys saw any of it, but it's a pretty scrappy game, the Sun. So, yeah. you know, and the Dunkley's has you know, is a good player for them out. Um, am, am I right in thinking Libba's not playing? Well, Libba didn't play last week. And I was, he was, rested, that, he, so, yeah. was he rested? So he's likely well, I think so, yeah. With Dunkley coming out. Um, that's likely, and maybe you can answer this. His liver's likely to come in. So Dunkley's coming out because he was he's caught up in one of these being a, a, at an exposure site. So I, I just don't understand how it works. If he's been at an exposure site, obviously he's got to isolate for fourteen days. But hasn't he had contact with, with other players within his team? <laughs> Quite, any, quite, okay. quite. Well, no. Well, do, I, don't we want do we want them to know that? Primary contacts, unless he's positive. Unless he's positive, yes. But, yeah. uh, so, I mean, otherwise your circles would be. Yeah, massive. you'd have. Yeah. yeah I'm, like I'm, otherwise, was, everyone. Yeah. Just you know, trying to get their whole midfield. But if uh, he was positive, right. <laughs> then well, if he was positive, then yes, because remember that's what happened with Essendon last year with the Irish player. Um, they were before us, before the game against us. Um, if he had been po- – was he positive? Was no, he wasn't positive? in the end. And false. so false. they had to look at all that vision. Now with Delta, they would not – that whole team would be um, a, a primary contact yeah. um, and the game would be presumably called off, although the AFL have said – made a flag in the, the thing. Oh, the, if you've the, got 23 you know, players. The show will go on if you only got 20 fit players. <laughs> well, they said <laughs> 20. We'll I be think... in that situation and our Casey team will come out. And <laughs> they've, they've stated, I think, if you've got 23 players that can play, then you game on. I'm not sure. Maybe what... they should, as a risk management strategy, send the Casey team to Queensland 
and send the the other team, the current best twenty two, to Perth for, <laughs> to get there for two weeks to lock in and send our Casey team up to Queensland. Are you happy for the Casey team to play the Gold Coast? Is that what you're suggesting, or just to be yeah, there? Yeah, yeah, I'd love to see that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think Dunkley will be a great loss in the in the greater scheme of things. I think this was his first game back from an injury, um, if I remember. So um, uh, it'll be. I, th- I think the real critical thing in this game will be like it was in the first uh, game against them. It'll be the midfield um, versus Libba. We've got to stop him getting the, his hands on the ball and getting out, getting it out to the McCrays and Bontempelli's and Hunters and players like that, and because they're the ones that cut you to pieces, uh, particularly, uh, particularly out of the middle. Um, but yeah, it'll be be interesting how we go into this. Is game. This where we used uh, Harms last time successfully. This is on, where we this is where we used Harm. and, yeah, and, Harms. Harms just blanketed him. But and Ball at Viney to he's the perfect up for um, yeah. even better than Harms in some respects because he'll yeah. tackle hard, harder. And I mean, this is the classic game for this whole discussion about has you know will other teams go to, to school on what um, Clarkson did to us? Well, let's see if the dogs change their game plan to negate us by kicking scrubby underground kicks into our back half. Um, you know, they're not going to, are they? They've got a way that they back themselves into play. I've heard. Bird Beveridge say exactly this thing after the Richmond game. He said, no, no, no. He was asked about that in the post-game press. He was, well, seeing they smashed you in the second half, will you change? what will you change next time you play them? He said, well, nothing, because we'll back our system in to beat them and next time we'll do it better. And, and, and of course, you know, they'll make some adjustments as we will with them. Um, but as George pointed out, the, you know, top teams have their way of playing and they've trained for years to deliver that um, and so that you know, the, at most they'll make some tweaks to negate the opposition strengths, as we have done all season. As we will, exactly like tagging Libba, we'll do the same sort of thing again. But I also think they'll put t- time into Bailey Dale off the half back flank and really try to stop that sort of run which they did last time too. And um, you know, go to town and um, you know, sort of uh, try and negate uh, Norton. Is English playing? Yes. Is, so, yeah. So again, is I mean, playing they, very well. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, their ruck, you know, so again, hopefully we'll be able to take advantage of their, their sort of relative weakness that they're rucking, albeit, you know, English is, you know, solid play. The problem with English is that he does go forward and can mark and kick goals. Mm. All right. Um, I think we'll end it there. We've gone uh, two hours. Um, didn't think a draw would, uh, would be able to get the distance, but... Uh, we here we are. Um, all right. David King got me angry, so <laughs> can we just have a sort of no more David King for? <laughs> all right. Um, it was a good thing Brian Taylor wasn't commenting on the yeah. game. Well, we've got Saturday night, so that's a, it's actually uh, worked out well. We we got some prime time games um, in this, you know, but particularly in the times when. Um, People can't get to the game, so I think it's, it helps out when we're on um, on free to air TV right. in terms of sponsors. Yeah. All right, boys. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, George. Thank you, Bim Man. Um, and we'll be back next week. Let's go, Demons. Go Red Legs. Come on.